Uh, it's very exciting to be back here. This is my favorite conference. Uh, it's been a long time, um, almost, what, four years now? Um, so it's just, it just feels electric to be, to be here and to be able to share this talk with you. Um, before I get to uh, a story about data access, uh, I just wanted to say that my co-speaker, Jeb, was taken ill uh, yesterday, and uh, he is not able to be here uh, to uh, give this talk with me. So uh, I'm going to try to do it justice, but uh, Jeb, we're thinking about you. We hope you feel better. Uh, you are the primary reason I'd say this project was successful at, uh, at Newbank. Um, it was not just Jeb that helped with this. Uh, there is also Kenji Nakamura, Wilker Lucio, uh, Ed Weibel, uh, and design from Rich, which was uh, essential. Uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, but yeah. Uh, so this is our story about unorganized data and how we got constant time look up into it. I'm Gadi Shaban. I am an engineer in the applied research group at Newbank. So Newbank, we are a Neobank, which means we're online only. Everything is done through the mobile app, okay? Those are our branches. The mobile apps are our branches. So we have uh, 80 million customers now. We are the world's largest Neobank. We don't just do banking. We are uh, full financial services. Tons of requests, tons of Kafka messages, tons of data. We keep track of every transaction. I mean, it is a bank, so it's very critical to do that. Um, money is involved, so we must be secure. We protect our customers in depth. One of the ways we protect our customers is through mutual TLS. This is not the only way we protect customers, but uh, this is like the TLS that you're familiar with in browsers where a client handshakes with the server and you know you want to make sure that that green padlock is there and that the server that has a certificate that is signed by an authority that you trust, which is really the, the, the browser vendors. But um, mutual TLS is like that, except the server also verifies the client. And in this case, Newbank verifies that the client handshaking with the server is a certificate that was generated by Newbank and it's trusted by Newbank. Okay? So once certificates are issued, they cannot be changed. They can only expire at their expiration time. So they're inherently valid. The problem is, is when phones are lost, when phones are stolen, when there's fraud, uh, we want to be able to cancel those certificates. And so we can't go in the world and find all the certificates that we don't want and puncture them and render them useless. So the only way to do that is to keep track on the server side. And these are called certificate revocation lists. Okay, this is the technique that all uh, all servers use, uh, even client browsers use certificate revocation lists to, in, uh, to ignore servers. So it's a big list. It's actually a set. I don't know why they're called certificate revocation lists, but they're sets. Um, we consult these lists during the handshake. So the client sends a cert. We check that it's not on the revocation list. If it is on the revocation list, we yank our hand back and we're like, all right, too bad. Okay. So this happens on every TLS handshake. It's critical. It happens billions of times uh, a day. It has to be fast. It has to be robust. So uh, what does this list look like? OK, so here's a picture of how it's represented in a snapshot on S3. Every certificate has a serial number on it. And the serial number is essentially the identity for the certificate. OK, so it's a big pile of unorganized Eden sitting on S3. What do I mean by unorganized? So Eden has structure. You know, we see a map here. It has a key, serial numbers. There's a vector. It's filled with maps. Each map has two keys. It has structure, but it's not organized. I'm not talking about, um, well, it's not arranged in a particular way that's useful to us, OK? So, uh, it's probably listed in whatever order the revocations happened in, or maybe whatever order the, uh, the process that slurped this out of a database from the system of authority, probably whatever order the slurp order was, and we made an Eden file, we put it on, uh, we put it on S3. So to, in order to use this, 
the first thing you have to do is to read the whole thing into memory, right? So this is one way to do it. This is not how I'd recommend to do it, okay? This is just a naive thing, and I'm gonna uh, illustrate a point here. So we're gonna slurp this file from S3. We will read it with Eden. We'll drop everything but the serial number. Maybe we'll drop some of the uh, already expired certs along the way, because there's no point in retaining certs that are expired. They're, they're invalid if they're expired, so can't, you can't kill it twice, okay? So, all right, we got a seek in memory. It's good. It's faster than it being on S3, right? It's, now it's local. Um, but still, there's no organization. If you want to find something in this list, what do you have to do? You have to go record by record, okay? And we know that's linear time. And especially here when there's millions of records and you're looking for the absence of the certificate. So that linear time, you're gonna get the worst case scenario pretty much every time because most certificates are not revoked. Most certificates are valid. It's only the fraud, the loss, that, those kind of cases. So this is obviously dumb, okay? You wouldn't, you wouldn't wanna do this. But So even if you have Eden and it has structure, it still takes a lot of work to do something useful to it, okay? So, so we, we get leverage by organizing the data. This is the critical aspect of this talk. Leverage comes from organization. And there are only a couple ways to organize data. One way is to sort it. So, so if we take all the cer uh, serial numbers and we put it in sorted order, this opens up approaches like divide and conquer, like binary search, okay? Now you're logarithmic time, you're not linear time. You've gained some leverage. It's less work to do a thing. So that sounds good, logarithmic sounds good, but for cases like non-membership tests, when you're looking for the absence of something, you're gonna get the worst case of logarithmic every single time, okay? You have a million elements, million uh, elements in this set, so two to the 20th is a million, log two of a million is 20. So you're gonna go binary search around this thing and it'll get shorter and shorter and eventually you're gonna not find the certificate and then the request will pass. So logarithmic isn't awesome but great, it's better than the, the obviously dumb thing but we can still do better. When we're looking up things by key and this is what you're doing when you're, uh, when you're checking for membership in a set, okay? You are actually getting, an, you're getting an element by key. It just happens to be that sets are maps where the key and the value are the same, uh, same thing. So we have a trick here, and this is hash organization. This is better than sorted organization for this use case because uh, now it's effectively constant time. We use these data structures in closure everywhere, hash maps, hash sets, uh, they're effectively constant time, and the pedants will probably say it's well, actually log of a very wide branch, but it's, it's really good. It's much better than um, straight up binary search. So hash organization gives us the maximum amount of leverage for this use case of uh, lookup by key, and this is what we did in our CRL use case, certificate revocation list. I'm just gonna say CRL because it's so long. Um, so every hour, we take the Eden off of S3, we slurp it into a memory, we pour it into a hash set, and then an hour elapses, and we pull the next snapshot of the CRL from S3, load it into memory. And in between refreshes, there, there are also certificates that have been revoked since the last uh, snapshot was cut. And so we have a little trickle of those certs on the side. Okay, how'd that work out? Well, it's pretty good, it's fast, it's robust, it's in memory, you're not talking to a network service that can, uh, that can have faults. Uh, you get that sub-millisecond check. It's relatively affordable, a few dozen megabytes of memory in heap per JVM. A couple seconds to load from uh, S3. So a little bit of a delay to start up time, a little bit of compute, but life is pretty good. This small snag, though, is that each individual process holds the same hash set, right? They're slurping the same file from S3. They're doing the same thing to it. 
They're getting leverage by organizing it. But that organization isn't shared. It's just repeated multiple, multiple times, okay? So it would be nice if we could write down a pre-organized set or a pre-organized map and share it. But a few dozen megabytes, not a big deal. But Newbank has been extremely successful, very, very fortunate, great growth. Uh, 80 million customers recently. So 50 megabytes of memory and two seconds to load turns into this gnarly two gigabytes of memory, these, these boat anchors sitting in your heap, okay? So, and then it takes like two minutes to load this. It's nasty, okay? Every JVM, every JVM in customer-facing services is redoing the same work over and over again to get leverage. So, uh, this is not great now, okay? We're lighting money on fire, and uh, Jeff Bezos is probably gonna live to be 260 years old. Um, but, so, what started out as an okay solution is not an okay solution anymore, okay? I'm gonna tell you a different story now, not about certificate revocation lists, but about unorganized data where we needed leverage into it. And in this case, the, uh, the, you can't just throw memory at the problem because it was larger than memory. So we have this ETL process at Newbank that uh, is this gigantic meat grinder that runs daily. And some of the inputs for this meat grinder are uh, information in transactional databases from Datomic. Some of the input are from models themselves, like data sets compute, computed by deriving other data sets. It's a lot of data. And the output of this meat grinder are uh, Avro files that go to S3. Some of these data sets need to be consumed and used by operational services, transactional services. Uh, one example of this is like credit limit increases. That service that authorizes credit limit increases needs to know what the risk model is for a customer, it needs to know what uh, you know, what the limit should be if it's, if it's approved. Other services like fraud detection need fraud profiles for customers. It's not the only way we detect fraud, but it's one of the ways. So this diagram is a total lie. You can't just go from an Avro data set. You can't randomly access Avro, and you certainly can't randomly access Avro sitting on S3, because Avro is uh, one of these data formats that's oriented towards use in a batch context. It's uh, designed for things like Spark. It's designed for um, it on mass processing. So it just doesn't support random access. So we need something to make that happen, okay? But this time we have terabytes of data. There's too much, uh, there's too much data to throw memory at the problem and memory is super expensive. So what do we do? Uh, we put it in a database. Newbank uh, lives in AWS, and so we reached for DynamoDB, which is an incredible database. It gives you deterministic low latency. It gives us the thing we need, which is look up by key. Again, same, same use case. So daily, after the ETL process runs, when an when a Avro file arrives in S3, uh, it triggers a process. If the, if the data set is one of these serving data sets that's gonna be sort of fed back into operational services, um, what'll happen is this trigger will spray the entire data set into DynamoDB. So that way it can be consumed by credit limit services or by uh, fraud detection or whatever. There's like a thousand different data sets uh, that fall into this category. So how did that work out? I'm just gonna skip. I mean, it's expensive. I'm not gonna show you the before and after. It's just, it's just a very expensive way to get lookup by key. We could have poured it into any other database, but DynamoDB has um, some nice guarantees. It gives you deterministic latency no matter, uh, no matter how big the uh, database gets. So it also allows us to organize the data a single time. This DynamoDB database, it, it's updated daily and services can just go to it. They don't have to reorganize data themselves like in the CRL case, okay? So, we got our leverage, but because we have thousands of data sets, it's just expensive. Too many write capacity units that you have to purchase to make this happen. Two use cases so far. 
We have unorganized data and we want to gain leverage into it. So we had a hunch that these are not the only two use cases. When you have two use cases, you probably have like five or six at least. So we had a hunch that many teams needed this look up, into, look up by key into various unorganized data sets. And we had built or were planning to build expensive solutions, bespoke solutions, solutions that only solve a single use case, right? Independent teams building solutions to their own problems. But we think there was an underlying categorical problem. Actually, Rich identified this, that this is a categorical thing that uh, we needed to look, look up by key into mostly stable data sets, data sets that grow over time, that um, the values that are associated with keys aren't really changing. So we reached out to other teams and we solicited more use cases, more stories that f uh, fit a similar mold. Um, and I don't think, this is a summary of the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet's actually much larger um, and it contains a lot of information about the use cases. What's the cardinality of each set, or, or sorry, each map? Um, some of them are sets. Uh, what are the size of the keys? What are the uh, semantics of the keys? What are the values? What are their semantics? Are they fixed length? Are they variable length? What's the primary operation for this service? Is it a non-membership test? Is it a membership test? Are you looking up some nugget of information associated with each key? We ended up finding a bunch of these things. So uh, new banks organized into shards. All of our services are cloned physically. The in entire infrastructure is cloned and each customer is assigned to one of these clones. And when, when a customer is born, they, and they're born into one of these shards, these clones and they never migrate to another shard. Once they're born there, they stay there. So um, a lot of services that have social features where you want to interact with other customers, you might need to look up, you might need to look up what shard a customer lives in, okay? So that's like a simple key value use case. There were other use cases like uh, experimentation platforms where you do A-B testing and you have customers in the A, A group, customers in the B group. There might be parameters associated with each customer. Uh, there were use cases for looking up the credit card UUID by the credit card number um, that's used inside uh, transaction processing. So we found a lot of these things and we distilled them. Uh, this discovery process led to like kind of insights about all the use cases. The main insight is lookup by unique key is sufficient. None of these services were doing range scans uh, or any other sort of data access patterns. It's really just lookup by key. The data sets did vary. They varied in size, encoding, fixed length, variable length, whether the data sets were able to be local, whether they were remote and large. Uh, all of these data sets involve stable data, unchanging, just kind of growing. And we wanted to do better than linear time. We wanted to do better than logarithmic time. And we started thinking about what the characteristics of a solution uh, was. So better than logarithmic, because logarithmic time for the CRL case when you're doing non-membership checks, logarithmic's bad. You're gonna get the worst case logarithmic on billions of requests. And actually, the ones that you, the requests that you want to reject, they're going to short circuit early, right? So that's that's not um, that's not ideal. We want it to be cheap. Organize the data a single time. Write it down. Share it. And we also didn't want uh, it to be very expensive. So low memory requirements. So not, I mean, memory is the most expensive thing you can uh, purchase in uh, AWS. And obviously, we wanted to support all these disparate use cases. So we came to a solution. Actually, Rich designed this solution. Uh, we call it the durable hash index. It gets fast lookup by using a hash organized data structure like Closure Maps. So it's the constant time access, asterisk. Um, we don't support updates. It relies on disk, not memory. So it's cheap, allows us to organize the data once. 
Uh, and we have SSDs, which are super fast, so we use them. And we support all our use cases by creating an index that is unattached to the data set. It's, it is disconnected, it is elsewhere. And we do this all in a closure library, and it's not a large, it's not like a large library. So let's dive into this tool, this library. So what's an index? Uh, an index, dictionary definition time, if you're playing the closure conj bingo game, you can now cover a square. Um, it is a list of topics or names that are treated in a printed work that gives, for each item, the page number where it may be found. Okay, so is an index useful on its own? No, I'm not looking for the page numbers, I'm looking for the content that is associated with the topic that I'm looking for. So an index looks a lot like a map, uh, it's not key to value, it's key to location, and then location to value elsewhere. But I said it was a hash index, what's a hash index? It's a list of hashes contained in a data set that gives for each hash the offset where its associated content may be found. Ooh, and I just switched from uh, Firefox to Safari and I see that there's a rendering glitch, but um, so yeah, so there's hashes that are associated with uh, the locations of the juicy bits, the values that you're looking for. And in most cases, these values that you're looking for are actual maps or values. They're not um, like the set case, the certificate revocation list, that's a degenerate case. That's key to key, right? Okay. All right, so what's a hash? Hash organized trees, like the ones used in closure data structures, they deal in hashes not keys, and these hashes must be uniformly random to achieve the performance guarantees that the data structures give. So uh, we found a bunch of keys, different types of keys when we were doing our, our use case discovery. Uh, some of the use cases were, I mean, most of the use cases had random UUIDs, and 16 bytes of a random UUID is totally suitable as a hash. You can just use those 16 bytes directly. Same thing with SHA-256 outputs. Those are designed to be uniformly random and collision free, so those are also suitable as hashes. Now there's a bunch of other different types of keys, like uh, squids, semi-sequential UUIDs, where not all the bits in the data are random, and those are not good for reasons that I'll, uh, I'll visually show you later. Uh, and the same, the same reasoning applies to other types of uh, keys, like integers, datomic entity IDs, arbitrary strings where you don't control the length, like you need uniformly random fixed length hashes, okay? So that's a requirement to play with a hash index. Okay, so our solution has two parts, the index at the end of the book, and then the data set, the actual book contents that, you're, that you have. So what does the data set portion of this look like? It's, a, it's an abstraction. This is defined by an interface that has uh, two primary methods. It's an SPI, service provider interface. It's uh, like an API where you call an API, but in an SPI, the program calls you and you customize the, the behavior. So we're gonna customize the behavior of this index by connecting it to different data sets that implement this data set abstraction. The primary method you need to play is look up a record at the given offset. That's the fundamental method. So give me, given a page number, give me the content. Give me, given an offset, give me the record there. The other thing you need to uh, implement to play with this is uh, a function called offset seek, and this does iteration over the data set. It's used for indexing, so it's only, it's only called once, whereas the other one's called uh, every time you need to look up something but that returns a seek of each hash and the associated offset. So your data set needs to be able to expose its, um, its keys and values, or its keys and locations. All right, let's look at, let's work through a few different instantiations of this abstraction, and for each one, I want you to imagine the implementation of record at, how would that work? All right, first, first use case, CRL. Uh, our data set is a file, and a file with the raw serial numbers back to back abutted. Okay. Serial numbers are, let's say they're UUIDs, they're gonna be 16 bytes apart, 
And so the implementation of record at here is going to say, given an offset, go slurp 16 bytes at that offset. That's your, uh, that's your value, the serial number. It's pretty simple. A different use case, this customer to shard map. Uh, imagine now you have a file that had 18 byte records, still fixed length records, 16 for the UUID, two for a small integer, and the integer represents the shard that uh, a customer lives in. And uh, keep in mind that this data set's not sorted in any particular order. We're gonna use the index to give random access, but the data set does not have to be arranged in any particular way. So the implementation of record at here is just the same thing. It's just slurp 18 bytes, and now you have a record that has two keys in it. Other potential data sets are, um, if you have variable length records, which are super common, at least in uh, ETL cases or big data cases, uh, you could put blobs that have the size of the blob in front of it, so length prefixing each blob. The blobs can be stored as transit, freshen, JSON, Eden, whatever, it doesn't matter. But they're individual blobs. It's not like one big Eden data structure is the whole file. These are different blobs. So for this, to look up a, to look up a record at an offset, just go read the offset, which gives you the length of the blob, and go read that many bytes, you get the blob, and now go decode the blob with however you encoded it. Boom, you're done. Your blobs might not be self-describing. Uh, you might have a schema or some header that, un that informs how to decode the blob, but this is a general pattern that you'll see. Avro actually works like this. Avro has the schema up top, and then each record is actually um, uh, just the values without keys. And so you need to be able to understand the schema so that you can decode the blobs. But Avro is not random access because it has internal blocks, they're compressed, none of the APIs support, um, support random access even if, you, uh, even if you didn't compress the internal blocks. So it's just not an ideal format for that. Uh, surprisingly, CSVs are directly usable as this data set abstraction. And our tool has an implementation of this data set abstraction that allows for indexing CSVs directly. How? Well, the offset represents the beginning of the line, and so you go read till the end of the line, and then you divide, uh, you, you divide the line on commas and uh, zip map it with the column headers. Boom, you're done. Now, iteration, uh, exposing the data a CSV for indexing is a lot more complicated because most CSV libraries don't support like showing you the line number, but anyway. Lots of different implementations of data sets. So two different pieces, the index, this data set abstraction. The index is a concrete thing. It is not an abstraction. We use a data set, uh, a data structure that's very common, Hamty, hash array map tree. It is straight up the implementation from Bagwell's ideal hash trees paper. It's on disk, not in the Java heap. The hashes are unique, so you don't have collision nodes. The root size is tunable, and all the node contents are tagged integers. And so they either represent an offset in the data set, or they represent an offset in the Hamty, in the, in the, data, in the index data structure itself. And the tag tells you which it is. So what does a Hamty look like? This is the logical model, not the physical model. If I'm looking for the key foo, I hash it, I get a hash code split up the hash code into little chunks. So the blue chunk tells you uh, which index in the root node. Then you navigate the root node down to that middle node. And then uh, the orange or yellow chunk tells you, oh, you need to access index six in, uh, in that node. Index six contains 99. And there's, again, there's two types of integers. Either it's a pointer into the Hamty itself or it's a pointer into the data set. So, this purple one, again, is a pointer into the index. And so we dereference that, go to the bottom node, and then the last, the red bit of hash tells you, oh, access index position one in this node. And that tells you it's a green integer. It's 166. That is interpreted as an offset in your data set. And then we go ask the data set, hey, give me the record at that 
position. So uh, Hamptys only use enough hash to find an empty slot as it's navigating. So when you're inserting stuff into the uh, Hamty, you don't go all the way down. Because if you went, uh, you went all the way down, you had a very deep tree. And remember, we're inside a file here. We're doing random reads in a file. So uh, you, want the file, you want the tree to be as shallow as possible. So Hamptys, including closures, data structures, do not go all the way down. They don't consume the entire hash. So what, what can happen, though, is that you insert a key using some prefix of the hash, and then you're looking for another key that has the same prefix of the hash, but a different suffix. And so you go through the Hamty, you navigate down, you find the offset, you ask the index, hey, give me the record at this offset. But that's a record that is connected to a different hash. So you need a way to confirm that the thing you found was the thing you're looking for. The hash of the record that you found was the hash that you were looking for. So uh, there's one more method in this data set abstraction, which is hash of, and this is used for confirmation. Given a record now, give me its hash, okay? So all three of these things are essential to, uh, to be correct. And this record at, uh, sorry, this hash of method, it's, there's a similar confirmation process inside closure hash maps, okay? Because they're, they're organized by hash, they're not organized by key. You have to confirm that the thing you found had the same key that you're, you were looking for. Okay, if you have non-random hashes, this is what's gonna end up happening in your Hamty. You're gonna have these long strands that go very far down and then there's gonna be some populated area. So if you were using uh, squids or anything that has non-random hashes, uh, you'll, you'll end up with these like hot spots in the tree. And when you go to access this stuff, remember each one of these hops is a random read in a file. And so you're gonna get a lot of random reads. So that's not good. So you want this ideal. You want a very wide, flat, shallow tree. This is what a good tree looks like. Ideally, one random IO after the root navigation. How do you do that? Well, instead of splitting up the hash and navigating down the tree using fixed hash segments, just make one big giant step at the, at the beginning and have a very wide, fat root. And so that's what we do here. 20 bits on the first step, then indexing by five bits all the way down. But hopefully you don't go all the way down. Hopefully you just do one big step at the root, then one step after that. There are other choices like uh, whether your root node is gonna be left on disk and you do random accesses into the root node, or you can slurp the root node into memory. Those are choices that you can make. All of this is described in the Ideal Hash Trees paper. It's really, really a great paper. The disk part, the different variable size roots, it's all there. So uh, you'll end up having this wide, flat tree with most, uh, most accesses being one step away from the root and a handful of them being two steps away. That's the ideal. So everything I've showed you so far is the logical model of the Hamty. The physical model, it's in a file, so you have to take all the nodes and sort of flatten them and extend them to the right. This is actually the same way it works in memory, but we have this object abstraction that um, fools us. So putting it all together, this durable hash index provides an implementation of iLookup, so it can participate in calls to get by implementing this valet method. So how does it work? User asks for a hash from the hash index. The implementation will go consult the ham tea, say, hey, do you have this hash? If so, it returns the offset. We pass the offset to the data set abstraction. The data set abstraction returns us a record, but we have to check, does that record have the correct hash? So we call the data set abstraction again, and we say, hey, what's the hash of that record? If those hashes match, then we return the record to user code. Cool. How do you create the index? Okay, um, so it is very mutable, it is very naughty, it's scribbling into a file, 
Um, there's multiple phases. The first phase can produce garbage in the file. The second phase will rewrite everything and drop the garbage. It's nasty. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all described in the paper. It's, this is not the focus of what I want um, to convey. It's more about the abstraction here. All right, how do we use this thing? So we call DHI slash open. We point to a file path that contains the index. And then we pass it a bag of parameters that uh, tells the index how to connect to the data set. Okay, so we say, here are my SPI functions. Here's this initial data so that you can construct the SPI in the first place. Um, actually, no, this is terrible. Don't make APIs like this, because this is like handing the user a, a, like a map full of live grenades. They're gonna get some detail wrong they're going to, it's gonna be inconsistent and you're gonna lead, you're gonna have some, uh, you're gonna have a postmortem if you do that, okay? <laughs> what do we do instead? Uh, we encode all this information into the metadata of the hash index, just this thing at the very beginning, and it's literally Eden. Eden containing the number of hash bits and pointers back into the functions. And I say literally Eden. I mean, it's like this is the file, and if you like, if you look at it in using less, you'll see some Eden payloads, and then you'll see some gobbledygook afterwards. But all you need to use the durable hash index is the durable hash index library and some code that matches whatever code is being pointed at in this header. So some class path functions, probably like 50 lines of code to implement the data set abstraction. And so the open call really looks like this. Just open the index, and the index contains all that you need to know to connect to the data set. It's a much better API, so uh, use this trick. So what do we learn here Making categorical solutions that encompass a lot of use cases, this is really a great thing. You can write like 500 lines of code and you can solve many, many, many different problems that are all of the same mold. It feels good, it works well, uh, it, it feels better than making bespoke solutions that only solve a single use case. So did it work? Well, for the certificate revocation list, we went from two gigs resident in each heap to six megabytes. And, I mean, it was dramatic, the visual. This is a huge amount of money. Um, I, I think over $2 million in EC2 costs uh, annually. This is, this is just from one service, this picture. So you can see the, the heap dropping a lot. There's a lot less pressure on the garbage collector. When you have really long-lived objects that are like the roots of hash maps, uh, the garbage collector, it's just more stuff in the garbage collector's way. You know you can't collect it. So um, not only do we save money, also the, the garbage collectors had less pressure on them. It was great. What does the six megabytes represent? It, it's actually the size of the root node in the Hamty. So it's a million elements wide. Each element is a six byte integer, so six megabytes. Pretty cool. Uh, we ended up using EFS to store a lot of these data sets and actually the index itself. This was a huge surprise to us. EFS is Amazon's elastic file system. It is essentially NFS as a service and it performed better than we could ever imagine. We were getting sub microsecond, sub millisecond um, accesses, uh, we, it, it scaled extremely well, and it was easy to operate, so it's pretty cool. EFS was, is a great technology. It's not appropriate for everything, but it's a, it's a nice tool. In general, though, disks are amazing. They are a forgotten tool in the toolbox. Uh, it's a shame that Kubernetes and a lot of these container uh, scheduling uh, container orchestrator tools uh, de-emphasize disks and make, make disks really hard to use. Everything's about stateless this, stateless that, but uh, you don't want to forget about 
using disks as an essential tool for designing systems. So that's all I have for you, but uh, if you want to learn more about Newbank, scan this code, and I really, really, really appreciate you uh, listening to this talk. Thanks.